Okay. So I'm so glad to be here and uh, welcome. If you can't see my display from where you're sitting, there's a break after my little presentation so you can come on up and get a closer look. Having taught voice for over 35 years, I can say with certainty, like most voice teachers, that few things make me more proud than when I ask a student, what is this piece about? And they say, well, basically, it's about love, <laughs> which indicates to me that they don't really know what this is about. <laughs> As I look back at a lecture recital I presented as a part of my uh, DMA work here, which was on my, my father's song literature, and as I remember the many performances I have given of his songs, I think that if someone were to ask me, what are your dad's songs about, I would say, well, basically, they're about love. <laughs> <laughs> love of text love of a particular voice, love of the act of composition, and some of the songs are actually about love. My father drew from 81 different sources for the text of his solo songs. The greatest number of them were from the Bible. The other texts include, um, well, in the Bible, in the biblical text, that includes five different settings of the 23rd Psalm two settings of an alleluia, and three settings of the Lord's Prayer. The balance of the repertoire includes Greek poets in translation, theologians and philosophers, great American contemporary poets, 59 of whom were men, and 15 of whom were women, poems by students, family members, and friends, texts written collaboratively, collaboratively with colleagues, original composition, original text by the composer and traditional text used in folk song and spiritual arrangements. He wrote the majority of his songs in English, but also wrote sets of folk songs in French, Greek, Swedish, and a Sabbath service for solo voice in Hebrew. Weltenspiegel, a song cycle in German, is of special interest. My father met Paul George Koch, a minister in Alsace-Lorraine during World War II, when the Rainbow Division was serving in that region. They renewed their friendship by mail in 1978. Koch sent him this book, a book of poetry called Weltenspiegel, which means mirror of the world. The song cycle sets eight poems, by Pastor Koch and was written for and dedicated to my sister Lorna Lynn, who presented them to the poet in France in 1981. I'm so happy that Lorna is here today and that she was able to present these to Pastor Koch in person so many years after Daddy first met him. Because we are at the University of Colorado, I'm going to focus on the Boulder associations and Colorado connections to his song literature. Donald Sutherland at one end of the spectrum and Aileen Fisher at the other. Sutherland creating poetic translations of ancient Greek or Renaissance texts and Fisher with her vast experience as a children's poet drawing inspiration from nature. My father met Aileen Fisher during the summer of 1950 in Gold Hill. Her verses for children are widely acclaimed, and her loving descriptions of nature's creatures won many awards through the years. The genesis of the little song cycle, The Ladybug and Her Friends, goes back to a faculty recital, which my mom and dad did here on the Boulder campus in what was then the music room in the Norland Library. This was in 1951. The program included Francis Poulin's Le Bestiaire, a song cycle based on six poems by Apollinaire about animals and fish. My father was intrigued by the idea of having Aileen write some poems that he could set for a similar cycle, and she provided him with seven poems so suggestively that they virtually set themselves. The cycle was written for and dedicated to my mom, Lucille Lynn, 
who sang the premiere performance in recital at Green Lake in Wisconsin in 1954 with the composer at the piano. She later performed an orchestral version in Fort Collins with the symphony there in 1956. And there's also a chamber version, which uses the same instrumentation that Poulenc used for Le Bestier, string quartet, flute, clarinet, and bassoon. The songs are quite simple vocally and have been performed by children's choirs as well. My mother often concluded solo recitals with this mini song cycle. And I've been performing it a lot <laughs> in the last year and a half. And it never fails to bring smiles to the audience, the pianist, and the singer. I'm going to play an example of my mom singing the first two pieces with um, Kathleen Joyner at the piano.
Whitney is an accomplished artist. This is uh, an, a larger version of one of the illustrations in the book. And I have mock-ups, two mock-ups of the book here. It has yet to be published. Notice I say yet. <laughs> <laughs> but we hope to stage it in the next two years. Courtney's designs will be beautiful for sets and costumes. And I'm so glad that she is here and was able to make the trip from Oklahoma. Donald Sutherland was a brilliant scholar and a professor of classics here at CU from 1944 to 1971. He was a member of Gertrude Stein's inner circle in the 1930s, as was composer Virgil Thompson. He is probably best known as an early bio-bibliographer of Gertrude Stein's works for his translation of Greek plays and his 1971 book on Romanticism. My father admired his intellect, his humor, and loved to hear his stories about life in Paris in the 1930s. He had expertise in which my father did not, and their collaborations on art songs were fruitful. Returning to the Sutherland's art song text, you heard the three songs for Nikolai Eady last night in the concert and the solo Anacreon Do Act Your Age. So there's some background information in the program for you. Performed so beautifully by Abigail Nims, Josh Devane, and pianist Matsumi Moteki. The texts include translations by Ronsard, who was a French Renaissance poet called the Prince of Poets by his friends. And the ancient Greek poet Simonides, noted for his lyric poetry, and Torquato Tasso, considered to be the greatest Italian poet of the late Renaissance. Each poem tells its own story. Danai's song pays homage to Fauré's Les Berceaux, with its rocking rhythm in the sea and the accompaniment. My father admired Fauré's harmony, Fauré's songs, and this song, Les Berceaux, in particular. It's doubtful that my father would have come across these texts on his own. Similarly, the opportunity to have the song sung by a singer whom they both admired provided Sutherland with the motivation to select and translate these three remarkable texts. Unlike The Ladybug and her friends, the songs composed for Nikolai Eady present vocal challenges. In particular, the use of the E vowel in the high range and long sustained phrases. The songs were first performed in 1956 by CU alum Martha Updike with the composer at the piano. My father programmed these songs frequently either as a set or individually. He was very proud of these songs and wanted lots of singers to sing them and lots of people to hear them. The 1960s was a time of great turmoil and change throughout the world. One bright light among many whose lives were cut short was Dag Hammarskjöld, and this picture is right there. As you know, he was the second Secretary General of the United Nations. His posthumously published book of poetry and reflections, Begmarken, or Markings, was a spiritual journey which Hammarskjöld kept from the age of 20 up until the time of his death at age 47. It was published in 1963. It was given to my father by a good friend of the family, and he started reading it shortly thereafter. Perhaps because Hammarskjöld was Swedish and both of my father's parents came from Sweden, he felt a special connection to the words and the wisdom in the book. He quoted it frequently in rehearsals at Westminster Choir College. He had very little, my, my father had very little time for composition. I don't know about Hammarskjöld, but my father had little time for <laughs> composition. And yet he managed to create a 45 minute symphonic song cycle called Markings, which is full of um, introspections for orchestra poignant solos for dramatic soprano and a male chorus to emphasize the final statements in the work. And this is what it looks like. 
and you can come and look at it yourself. It has never been performed in its entirety, though many people have sung um, piano reductions and have played, um, you know, sung solos with piano or played the introspections on the piano. I'm going to play an excerpt of myself singing the piece tomorrow with my husband at the piano, and I hope that you will enjoy the slight sharping at the very end of the piece. It's, it's from excitement. <laughs> Schultz markings continued to serve as musical inspiration for my father throughout the rest of his life as evidenced by songs and choral works written in the 1970s and the 1980s. Rivers to the Sea is a song cycle for lyric soprano which sets poems by Sarah Teasdale um, from her book of the same name. You can see Sarah over here maybe, she's looking a dog. <laughs> it was written for Elaine Bridges, who was a soprano that studied voice with my father at Loretta Heights College during the late 1970s. She had a lovely high lyric soprano voice. The songs were written as both a compliment and a challenge to her vocal abilities. She had a very agile voice, and so she was most at home with run work. She found the long legato lines in the majority of the songs demanding. However, the tessitura is high and allowed the silvery timbre of her voice to shine. Because she was a fan of Teasdale's poetry, she recommended specific poems to my father. Having chosen the poems herself allowed her to sing with great sensitivity to the text and an increased expressivity. The accompaniments are not especially difficult, but require a sensitive pianist who enjoys a flexible rhythmic structure. I find this cycle to be similar to Robert Schumann's Frauenliebe und Leben, insofar as it presents a series of songs which describe a woman's experience of love and life in the first person. Unlike Frauenliebe und Leben, Rivers to the Sea does not offer a clear chronological progression, and the poet who provided the text was in fact a woman. The 10 songs in the cycle are brief, so the performer must make rapid changes in mood and demeanor. The longest lasts a, a scant two minutes, and the shortest only 40 seconds. The entire cycle is approximately 11 minutes in duration and is intended to be performed without pause. However, it's possible to extract a subset of the songs and perform a smaller group if need be. And that's something I did with my father's permission on several occasions. So if you were the daughter of a composer, and if you had spent a summer 
organizing a large closet full of music, <laughs> you might ask your father, what's your favorite piece? And the answer I got was Dusk in June, the fifth song in Rivers to the Sea. I never knew him to change his mind about this in later years. Of course, he may have told other people different things. But um, that was the answer I received. I will play this short excerpt with me singing again and my husband Alex at the piano. <coughs> The song cycle, Prayers from the Ark, was composed in 1979 for me to sing and play because my father knew that I liked to accompany myself, although this is a very bad habit for singers. <laughs> the texts were chosen from Rumor Godin's English translation of Carmel de Gastel's French book, Prière dans l'Arche. These poems imagine prayers offered to God by Noah and the individual creatures on the ark. My father let me pick out my favorite ones from the book. And I think I have it here. Yes. Prayers from the ark. These pieces are somewhat like those in the ladybug and her friends, but these pieces have animals that are expressing their own points of view rather than being insects who are described by an observer. Um, again, the songs are brief and require quick changes in uh, mood and demeanor. Some are humor humorous and others are quite poignant. I've performed this cycle several times at informal recitals with my father at the piano, but we didn't record them. Another project. You will find notes about eight American poets in the program booklet. This was the last song set, which my father composed. The song set uses poems by different poets, whereas the song cycle uses poems by a single poet. The eight poets are Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, John Greenleaf Whittier, Edwin, Edwin Arlington Robinson, Robert Frost, Carl Sandburg, and T.S. Eliot. The collective lifespan of these poets is 1803 to 1967. Excerpts from this set were heard last night on the concert performed by Gregory Staff. It sung so very beautifully. 
was especially uh, fitting that he was able to perform them since he was a student of my father's, and Mitsumi did a wonderful job accompanying. Many of the texts were chosen seem to uh, foreshadow my father's death, but he was not sick, and a great many poems have been written about death, so I don't think that there was any conscious intent in the selection of these particular poems. As I noted at the beginning of this presentation, the majority of the texts for my father's songs were chosen from the Bible. A special note are 20 pieces, which my mother selected for two volumes of sacred songs in the year 2000. And more props. <laughs> um, we self-published these, and where you'll, you'll often find a book, 10 sacred songs, and they're just in two different keys. These are 20 different songs. So the low voice have, have 10 of their own and the high voice 10 of their own. Um, there are some original melodies for familiar texts, which I think would be a fun challenge for a composer. You like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, come up with your own melody. Don't just sing the one everybody else knows. And so I, I think that's an especially good one. And, um, these are here for you to look through. There are a number of spiritual arrangements. Spirituals and folk song arrangements were of special importance to any composer coming of age in the 1930s, especially those studying with Roy Harris. This wellspring of inspiration never ran dry. Some pieces like Steal Away were set multiple times in different choral and vocal arrangements by my father. There are four song cycles which I did not include in this presentation. Three Songs of Hope and the Seven Last Words have sacred texts, and Sin Plains of Adelaide Prophecy and From Leaves of Grass, based on poems by Walt Whitman's book of the same name, have secular texts. The last time I saw my father, just four days prior to his sudden death by a heart attack, he gave me a set of pieces to be used for a production of James and the Giant Peach based on Roald Dahl's novel. I was the music director for a among many whose lives were cut short was Dog Hammarskjöld, and his picture is right there. As you know, he was the second Secretary General of the United Nations. His posthumously published book of poetry and reflections, Fegmarken, or Markings, was a spiritual journey which Hammarskjöld kept from the age of 20 up until the time of his death at age 47. It was published in 1963. It was given to my father by a good friend of the family, and he started reading it shortly thereafter. Perhaps because Hammarskjöld was Swedish and both of my father's parents came from Sweden, he felt a special connection to the words and the wisdom in the book. He quoted it frequently in rehearsals at Westminster Choir College. He had very little, my, my father had very little time for composition. I don't know about Hammerschel, but my father had little time for <laughs> composition. And yet he managed to create a 45 minute symphonic song cycle called Markings, which is full of um, introspections for orchestra poignant solos for dramatic soprano and a male chorus to emphasize the final statements in the work. And this is what it looks like. And you can come and look at it yourself. It has never been performed in its entirety, though many people have sung um, piano reductions and have played um, you know, sung solos with piano or played the introspections on the piano. I'm going to play an excerpt of myself singing the piece tomorrow with my husband at the piano, and I hope that you will enjoy the slight sharping at the very end of the piece. It's, it's from excitement. <laughs>
serve as musical inspiration for my father throughout the rest of his life as evidenced by songs and choral works written in the 1970s and the 1980s. Rivers to the Sea is a song cycle for lyric soprano, which sets poems by Sarah Teasdale um, from her book of the same name. You can see Sarah over here, maybe. She's looking at a dog. <laughs> It was written for Elaine Bridges, who was a soprano that studied voice with my father at Loretta Heights College during the late 1970s. She had a lovely high lyric soprano voice. The songs were written as both a compliment and a challenge to her vocal abilities. She had a very agile voice, and so she was most at home with run work. She found the long legato lines in the majority of the songs demanding. However, the tessitura is high and allowed the silvery timbre of her voice to shine. Because she was a fan of Teasdale's poetry, she recommended specific poems to my father. Having chosen the poems herself allowed her to sing with great sensitivity to the text and an increased expressivity. The accompaniments are not especially difficult, but require a sensitive pianist who enjoys a flexible rhythmic structure. I find this cycle to be similar to Robert Schumann's Frauenliebe und Leben, insofar as it presents a series of songs which describe a woman's experience of love and life in the first person. Unlike Frauenliebe und Leben, Rivers to the Sea does not offer a clear chronological progression, and the poet who provided the text was, in fact, a woman. The 10 songs in the cycle are brief, so the performer must make rapid changes in mood and demeanor. The longest lasts a, a scant two minutes, and the shortest only 40 seconds. The entire cycle is approximately 11 minutes in duration and is intended to be performed without pause. However, it's possible to extract a subset of the songs and perform a smaller group if need be. And that's something I did with my father's permission on several occasions. So if you were the daughter of a composer, and if you had spent a summer organizing a large closet full of music, <laughs> you might ask your father, what's your favorite piece? And the answer I got was, Dusk in June the fifth song in Rivers to the Sea. I never knew him to change his mind about this in later years. Of course, he may have told other people different things, but um, that was the answer I received. I will play this short excerpt with me singing again and my husband Alex at the piano. <coughs>
album cycle, Prayers from the Ark, was composed in 1979 for me to sing and play because my father knew that I liked to accompany myself, although this is a very bad habit for singers. <laughs> The texts were chosen from Rumor Godin's English translation of Carmel de Gastel's French book, Prière dans l'Arche. These poems imagine prayers offered to God by Noah and the individual creatures on the ark. My father let me pick out my favorite ones from the book. And I think I have it here. Yes. Prayers from the ark. These pieces are somewhat like those in The Ladybug and Her Friends, but these pieces have animals that are expressing their own points of view rather than being insects who are described by an observer. Um, again, the songs are brief and require quick changes in uh, mood and demeanor. Some are humor humorous and others are quite poignant. I performed this cycle several times at informal recitals with my father at the piano, but we didn't record them. Another project. You will find notes about eight American poets in the program booklet. This was the last song set, which my father composed. The song set uses poems by different poets, whereas the song cycle uses poems by a single poet. The eight poets are Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, John Greenleaf Whittier, Edwin, Edwin Arlington Robinson, Robert Frost, Carl Sandburg, and T.S. Eliot. The collective lifespan of these poets is 1803 to 1967. Excerpts from this set were heard last night on the concert performed by Gregory Staff so very beautifully. It was especially uh, fitting that he was able to perform them since he was a student of my father's and Mitsumi did a wonderful job accompanying me. Many of the texts were chosen seem to uh, foreshadow my father's death, but he was not sick and a great many poems have been written about death, so I don't think that there was any conscious intent in the selection of these particular poems. As I noted at the beginning of this presentation, the majority of the texts for my father's songs were chosen from the Bible. A special note are 20 pieces, which my mother selected for two volumes of sacred songs in the year 2000. And more props. <laughs> um, we self-published these, and where you'll, you'll often find a book, 10 sacred songs, and they're just in two different keys. These are 20 different songs. So the low voice have, have 10 of their own and the high voice 10 of their own. Um, there are some original melodies for familiar texts, which I think would be a fun challenge for a composer. You like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, come up with your own melody. Don't just sing the one everybody else knows. And so I, I think that's an especially good one. And, um, these are here for you to look through. There are a number of spiritual arrangements. Spirituals and folk song arrangements were of special importance to any composer coming of age in the 1930s, especially those studying with Roy Harris. This wellspring of inspiration never ran dry. Some pieces like Steal Away were set multiple times in different choral and vocal arrangements by my father. There are four song cycles which I did not include in this presentation. Three Songs of Hope and the Seven Last Words have sacred texts, and Sin Plains of Adelaide Prophecy and From Leaves of Grass, based on poems by Walt Whitman's book of the same name, have secular texts. The last time I saw my father, just four days prior to his sudden death by a heart attack, he gave me a set of pieces to be used for a production of James and the Giant Peach based on Roald Dahl's novel. I was the music director for a production at a children's theater called Stage 11 down in Englewood. It meant a great deal to me that he was interested in this project and that he provided original music for the young singers. In summary, I feel so lucky 
to be a composer's daughter and also a composer's wife. Watching, listening, and collaborating has given me a great respect and some insight into the, the creative process and the act of composition. All of his 288 songs can be found in the George Lynn Archive at the American Music Research Center. I invite you <coughs> excuse me, to explore the extensive database which Stacy Landis has worked on very diligently this summer. Choose a song or a song cycle for yourself. There are too many for me to learn. However, if my father were here, and I do feel his presence here, I believe that he would encourage singers to make friends with a student composer 